being a Christian is not a comfortable life. I mean, don't get me wrong. We have comfortable things in our lives. And maybe that's just because we live in America where comfortable living is something that is uh, perceived to be part of the American dream. But I don't think God has called us as Christians to comfortable living. I don't think that at all. You see, while we're robed in this flesh, while we are wandering upon this earth, for as ever long as we call ourselves Christians, we have a job. And that job is to present Jesus to everyone we come in contact with, regardless of our age. You know, Daniel was 90 or so whenever he was thrown in the lion's den. Moses was getting close to 80 whenever he, was, he confronted Pharaoh and he led the Israelites out of Egypt. So regardless of our age, we have a job, and that is to offer individuals Jesus' message of hope, of renewal, of forgiveness and salvation. So what are our wages for sharing Jesus? What do we earn? You know, what is our take home at the end of the day for doing our job as Christians? It's not comfortable living. And we get difficulties, we get pain. You see, in this world, or rather on this world, Christians are destined for persecution. If you think about it, that is probably um, not a really great message to preach. It's something that we don't want to think about whenever we become Christians, that our destiny is not fame and glory, but it is uh, humility, servitude, and persecution. So the destiny of a Christian involves persecution. Uh, if you would, let's read, uh, going to skip to the very end, chapter 2, verse 17 through The fifth verse of chapter 3, Paul writes, But brothers, when we were torn away from you for a short time, in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing we made every effort to see you, for we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan stopped us. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we all glory, uh, we will glory in in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. Continues. So when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best uh, to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy, who is our brother and God's fellow worker, in spreading the gospel of Christ to you, uh, to strengthen and encourage you in your faith, uh, so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. You know quite well that we were destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted. And it turned out that way, as you well know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent Timothy to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter might have tempted you and our efforts might have been useless. You see, we're destined for persecution because the world identifies us as something foreign and dangerous. Think about for a moment how your body works. And some of you might say, you know, William, it's been a very long time since I had anatomy. And others, like me, I I didn't ever have anatomy in high school. But here's how our bodies work. A very oversimplification is that uh, there are individuals, or or rather bacteria or or cells, uh, that are in our bodies that are designed to identify the bad guys. So we have these good guys, and whenever we have these bad guys that come in, the good guys say, hey, they're not supposed to be here. And so it shoots out these white blood cells that go and attack these bad guys and do away with them, get rid of them. And so the world sees Christians as bad guys. The world sees us, especially those of us who who are fundamentalists, who look at the Bible and say, yeah, that Bible is the Word of God and it's relevant to my life and and, uh, there is absolute truth and, and it's found in Jesus. So the world sees us as Christians and they say, hey, you're hazardous to the progression of society. You're hindering the flow of life. You're old fashioned and you're part of the problem. Get out of the way. In fact, I don't know if you realize it, but 
Uh, certain lawyers with the ACLU actually blamed the shooting in Orlando on Christians. It was said, and I quote, Christian conservatives are responsible for the mass shooting at a gay bar in Orlando because they created this anti-queer climate. You have to understand that as society moves away from God, those who stick close to God will be seen as somebody who is not a part of society. And that's fine. Because the Bible tells us that, that this world is not our home. That we are strangers and pilgrims wandering towards a land that we will call home. Our promised land. The kingdom of God. And so Christians are seen as the bad germs in a world. Yet others who do bad or do evil are considered the good germs. Listen again and read again what Paul says. He says, you know quite well that we were destined for them, destined for persecution, for these trials. The Thessalonians were enduring some problems. Paul had been kicked out of the city, ran out of town. And he says, you know quite well that we were destined for these things. In fact, whenever we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted. I don't think Paul is just talking about himself and his, his uh, gospel companions. I think he's talking about Christians in general, talking about the Thessalonians. And he writes, and it turned out that way, as you well know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent Timothy to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter, that Satan, might have tempted you and our efforts might have been useless. And if you think about it, Paul sounds like a negative Nancy. Maybe in his day he was known as pessimistic Paul. So how did he know that the Thessalonians would be persecuted. How did he know that Christians would be persecuted? Well, Paul had this thing called personal experience. Not only had he been persecuting Christians, but once he became a Christian, he was persecuted. In fact, prior to coming to Thessalonica, he was beaten up and persecuted in Philippi. And so Paul writes to Timothy, his understudy, and he says, This is my gospel, for which I am suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. Paul was beaten, he was, he was bloodied, he was stoned. He received lashes. In fact, on one incident, one encounter, he was dragged out of the city, beaten. The people thought, well, he's dead. Paul's laying there, bleeding. His, his stoners, those who've just stoned him, are walking away. Paul finally comes to his senses, gets up, walks back into that same exact city. Paul was chained, but the gospel, he said, cannot be chained. Something else, that the reason that Paul knew was he remembered his Sabbath school les lesson. The prophets, I mean, the prophets in the Old Testament, what? They were, they were beaten, they were killed. Why? Well, because they prophesied an unpopular message. In a time where false prophets were saying, hey, the kingdom is good, everything is all right, no problems here, folks. Prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah are prophesying, no, it's not okay. We're heading to hell on earth if we don't repent. Paul likely even remembered Stephen's sermon. Stephen, the first Christian martyr, Paul, who witnessed it, who held people's coats so they could have a good throwing motion. Stephen, in his sermon, said, Was there ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one, and now you have betrayed and murdered him, talking about Jesus. But you might think, Okay, cool. That was 2,000 years ago. We're in a modern time now, William. Why should we still expect persecution? Well, because Jesus said so. Jesus said, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. We don't belong to the world. Typically, the human body does not uh, attack 
things that are supposed to be there. It's only the things that aren't supposed to be there that the body attacks. We're not supposed to be in this world. We're not created for this world, and so the world hates us because we belong to Jesus. Uh, Those were Jesus' words. Listen to what Peter said. Dear friends, do not be surprised at this painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. We haven't seen that level of persecution yet. You think about our brothers and sisters in other countries who are being killed, burned alive, skinned alive, crucified because of Jesus. Another reason that we know that persecution is still going to come is because Satan still is here. He still hates Christians, and he still wants to destroy the church. Peter says that Satan is like a roaring lion looking to uh, devour someone. He's not looking for those who, who are walking away from God. He's not looking for those who have made up their mind and are against God. Satan is looking to devour those who are wanting to serve God with their lives. He's looking for Christians to devour. And so, uh, Satan works through persecution in various ways. Uh, Just real quick, three different ways that Satan works through persecution. Number one is he discourages individuals through persecution. He, He discourages you and he says, listen, there's a much better way. You can avoid all of this problem. Just quit. Stop trying to be like Jesus and start being like the world and things will be so much easier. Besides, you're not very good at being a Christian anyways. You sinned just last week, remember? God's grace isn't that good for you, so just quit. Another way Satan works through persecution is through distancing us from the world. Satan alienates Christians and he shows, hey, you're nothing like these other people. Look how different you are. You're standing out like a duck in a room full of geese. You look more like a horse in a field full of cows. You're so different, just Satan also works in persecution through death. I mean, you think about it. If Satan through man can kill one Christian, how many are kept from wanting to become a Christian? What would happen in America if suddenly Christianity became illegal? And the death sentence was a punishment. There would be a lot of people who would no longer want to be a Christian. And there would probably be a lot of people who decide not to be a Christian. So as you see, Satan stands back and he taunts and he tempts. Yet, we have to move past those taunts. We have to move past those temptations And we looked at Jesus, and we have to do our job. Uh, I grew up in Mountain View, Missouri. Uh, In that town, uh, there is a pool. In fact, that's where Shana and I met one another at. I was a lifeguard. Uh, She was a a, a patron, I guess you could say. No, uh, it was not um, drowning or anything like that. I would love to say it was the other way around, and I was like that little boy in the sandlot who wanted to meet the lifeguard, and so he dives in the deep end, and he drowns so that she will save him and give him recitation mouth to mouth. It didn't happen like that. But in this pool, there is a deep end. It's 12 foot deep, um, separated from the five foot section by a rope. And there are two diving boards, as there used to be. Now there's only one. There is a low dive that, oh, it probably sets up from here to the floor, uh, three or four or five feet off of the water. And then there is also a high dive that was probably close to 12 feet, 12 to 15 feet off of the water. It was a lot of fun to, to dive off of it. But every now and then, there would be a kid who would climb up the high dive, and he would go to the edge, and he would just stand and stare, 
waiting for the board to get lower or the water to get higher, working up enough courage to jump off. Meanwhile, the line behind him is building up. The lifeguard is yelling, jump or get down. So they didn't jump. They would have to go and climb down the ladder almost in shame. See, as Christians, we've climbed a ladder of faith. We've uh, gone up to where God is through Jesus. And we are standing on the edge. And we have to decide, am I going to be serious? Am I going to move in faith? Am I going to step in faith? Am I going to jump out into faith? Or am I just going to get down and quit? I believe that there is a a time that is coming and and even then, even now, you see that we're progressing towards it. Uh, Living in this world is not real pretty uh, for Christians. It's not real popular. And And I believe that there's going to be a time in America where it's going to be even more unpopular. I mean, you think that uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars in bankruptcy for cake bakers is bad. I think a time is coming to where persecution will be on a whole nother level. For Christians in America. And it's getting to the point to where we need to either jump or climb down. We need to either take our faith seriously and go to work for Jesus, or else we need to just back off and just quit. Moving in faith is how we arrive at our destiny of persecution. And you say, but William, I don't want to be persecuted. I don't blame you. I used to hate getting spanked as a child. In fact, raise your hand if you liked to be disciplined growing up. Nobody. I don't want to be persecuted any more than you. I don't like pain. I don't want to be uh, forced to make a decision between Jesus or my life or between Jesus or my wife's life or my daughter's life. But to move in faith, that's how I get to my destiny of persecution. Moving in faith simply means that you're evangelizing, that you're witnessing, that you are testifying to who Jesus is and what he's done for your life. And to do this, you do two things. Number one, you have to dare to share. Dare to share. Let's read verses 1 through 6, chapter 2. You know, brothers, that our visit to you was not a failure, We had previously suffered and been insulted in Philippi, as you know, but with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in spite of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We're not trying to please men, but God who tests our hearts. You know we never used flattery, Nor did God put on a mask, or nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from men, not from you or anyone else. I love that line that, you know, we dared to tell you his gospel. Paul's saying we dared to share. He dared to share the gospel uh, because to share meant certain pain. To share meant that certain individuals might get the wrong idea. Oh, Paul, you're just trying to make money. Now, there are people in this world today who preach the gospel not because they care, but because they want to make money. It was a dare for Paul to preach because people might reject him. Yet, but as a result of God holding Paul up through the persecution, because that's what God does. He holds us up in our trials, in our, in our downtrodden times. He holds us up. He allows us to get through it. And so as a result, Paul dared to share because of the one that he wanted to please. He wanted to please God. To, to, to share or not to share, that's the question. That's the question that we're faced with. And, and the answer to that question is determined based on who you want to please. 
Who do you want to please? I might be wrong, but I believe that Paul knew about Jesus' teachings. And I, knew that, I, I believe that Paul likely knew about Jesus' message to the twelve prior to sending them out, which was what I tell you in the dark. Speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Paul maybe had that if he did tattoos, which he probably didn't. Paul could have had that verse tattooed on his forehead so that every time he looked into a mirror, he read it. He was such a bold individual. He didn't care what people did to him. In fact, he said, we're not trying to please men but God. We were not looking for praise from men, not from you or anyone else. Paul wanted to please God no matter what the cost. What about you? What about me? What about us? As Christians, we have to avoid the desire to receive the praise of men, the praise of this world. And it's tough sometimes. One of the ways that Christians receive the praise of this world is by being politically correct. And political correctness can be a deterrent to evangelism, to sharing the gospel, because... The gospel is not a politically correct message. Not at all. Political correctness, uh, from my understanding, seeks to not offend. It, it doesn't want to rock the boat. It just wants to keep everybody just calm. And, and to an extent, I like political correctness. I like to not offend people. And I think that goes along with something that is found in the Bible. Something where Jesus talks about how you know we're supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves. Something that Paul talks about, that we're to live in peace. He says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Also, Jesus' words to the twelve, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. And so I think that as Christians, we're called to um, not be super offensive which is hard because our message is super offensive. But the problem that I have with political correctness is the general attitude that it breeds that just says, hey, let's just agree to disagree. Let's just take truth and let's just package it in a nice little box with a little bow and then let's just throw it in the trash can. Forget about truth. Let's just agree to disagree. Let's hold hands and sing kumbaya, but don't say Lord because that's not right. Political correctness is something that we have to uh, fight against to a degree because it tells us that the message that we have should be edited, done away with. Because the gospel says that only through Jesus are people saved. Only through Jesus. He's the only way. You see, we're not loving our neighbor. We're not living at peace with people whenever we exchange the gospel of Jesus for a watered-down message. And that's what the world would have us to do in order to avoid persecution. You know, um, take your Bible and mark out Jesus, uh, put in something better, Uh, mark out this verse, this verse, take away hell, and then just write, everybody goes to heaven. And then preach that. That's what the world would have us to do. But if we're to please God... All scriptures, God bring. We preach the entire gospel, even those who are die outside of Jesus Christ, and they go to hell. So in our world, it is a dare to share the gospel. It is a dare to share the gospel because it's not a political correct message. Now, even though the gospel is offensive, that doesn't mean that we need to be offensive. We preach an offensive message, but we aim to not offend. So don't throw out tact and love in order to tell people about Jesus. We seek to please God and share the gospel. And we also are called to delight in the light. Delight in the light. Paul writes, as apostles of, as apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you, but we were gentle among you. Like a mother caring for her little children, we loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. 
because you had become so dear to us. Surely you remember, surely you remember, brothers, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order to not be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. And we also thank God continually, because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as it actually is the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. Paul delighted in the light, the light being the gospel of Jesus, the message of the cross. He delighted in it because it changed his life. He was a sinner and he was, became a saint through Jesus. He was lost and he was found. He was blind and he could see. And Paul recognized that, that the power that was working to him was not just for him, but it was for everyone, both Jew and Gentile. And so as a result of delighting in the message, Paul loved those for whom the message was intended to go to. Paul loved sinners. He loved those that God loved. So not only did Paul delight in the message, but he shared it with the Thessalonians. Uh, he, he shared his life with them. Paul invested himself in, in the people there at the Thessalonica. And part of Paul's investment in the Thessalonians was that he exhorted them to live a holy and godly life. Paul said, For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God. Uh, the word that is used for encouraging, comforting, and urging, it, it can also be translated as admonishment. Admonishing. Paul devoted himself to churches that he founded, and he called them, he, he admonished them, or rather exhorted them to live godly lives. So as a result of delighting in the gospel, you and I, um, we should invest in those around us. And we should exhort and encourage one another to live a holy life worthy of God's calling. Hebrews 10.25 says, Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. If you're familiar with the King James Version, you might notice that the word for encourage is exhort in the King James. Exhorting. In high school, I had a really good friend named Levi Moore who actually he went off and played football in college, but he used to say in practice... Boys, he was from the south, Georgia, originally. He said, boys, if you fall down, you got to pick yourself back up by your bootstraps. As Christians, if we fall down, we don't have to bend over and pick ourselves back up by our bootstraps. That's what our brothers and sisters in Christ are for. To encourage us and to exhort us to keep running, to call us and to challenge us. You know, whenever that, that word exhortment, we, we talked about a little bit in Sunday school this morning, you know, generally it's, it's taken as, as something negative. Whenever someone says, listen, brother, listen, sister, you're doing something and I'm concerned about what you're doing because I've seen somebody in your exact same shoes who what they were doing, it led to this grievous sin. It led to their downfall. It led to them being drawn away from God. We're to exhort one another. Not because we want to gossip about one another, or not because we're better than other people, but because we love one another and we're saying, listen, I'm going to challenge you just as I want you to challenge me to live a godly life because that's what we've decided to do. Whenever we die to ourselves, whenever we're buried with Christ in baptism and rise to walk in newness of life, we're saying, Listen, folks, I want to be a new creation. In fact, the Bible says I am a new creation. And I want you to hold me accountable to this. So there's absolutely nothing wrong if you go to your brother or your sister in Christ, you say, hey, man, how's, how's your Bible reading going? How's your prayer life doing? Are you being tempted in any way? How can I pray for you? How can I hold you to this standard that we both are deciding to live by? See, delighting in the gospel 
results in delighting in those for whom the gospel goes to and to those for whom the gospel has been received by. Whenever I delight in the gospel, I delight in the sinner and I delight in the saint because God has delighted in me. So the gospel, the gospel is meant to flow through Christians to those of this world. But sometimes as, as a dam hinders the water or hinders the flow of a river, sometimes people hinder the flow of the gospel. And so those that hinder the spread of the gospel displease God. Uh, let's read the last two verses of our text. For you, brothers, became imitators of God's churches in, in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered uh, from your own countrymen the same things those churches suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus, Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They, talking about the Jews, they displease God and are hostile to all men in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. Uh, the way that Paul talks about the Jews in this letter, uh, you might think that if he were to talk about that like that today, he would be sued for defamation or anti-Semiticism. Uh, he'd probably even be label, labeled as a hater and, and charged for a hate crime. Paul says that they killed Jesus, that they killed the prophets, that they drove out Paul and his companions, that they displease God because they are hindering the gospel. They're hostile towards others. They forbid the Gentiles to even hear. And as a result of these things, they heap up sins to the limit. And Paul says the wrath of God has come upon them at last. See, whenever those who are not Christians hinder the spread of the gospel, they are heaping up their sins and they're storing up God's wrath for them. In fact, this is just the general uh, outcome for the unrepentant. Paul says it. But because of your stubbornness and the unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself. For the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, evil there will be wrath and anger. Paul talks about how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And so if those feet that are not bringing good news, probably ugly. But those that are Christians, and this is, this is a very serious point, those who are Christians who neglect the command of God to evangelize, because that's what the Great Commission says, whenever we neglect the command of the Father, we fail to comply ourselves, we fail to um, conform ourselves to his decisions, and that displeases God. Not sharing the gospel divorces us from God's plan for all humanity. Uh, he desires all to be saved, uh, to come to the knowledge of truth. He has sent Jesus uh, for everyone, whosoever will, uh, may come and drink of the waters of life. You know, the people that, that God has chosen to share the light are Christians, the church. If we are his body, if we are the body of Christ, we've got to start moving and, and sharing. And so what do we do that hinders the gospel from spreading? Uh, well, number one, we operate under preconceived notions. You know, we think, hey, you know, someone else is going to tell them. I, I, don't, I don't think I should tell them. Somebody else will. and uh, They won't listen to me. And so whenever we operate under these preconceived notions, we neglect doing God, uh, God's work, what he's called us to do. Uh, something else that hinders the gospel is purposeful neglect. We just, you know, we, those people, you know, those refugees from other countries, they're, they deserve hell. I don't want to preach to them because they're scary. That, 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 those, those who live in that LGBT community, community I don't want anything to do with them. We, they, we don't, don't go to them. I don't like them. It's going to forget them. So preconceived notions, uh, purposeful neglect, and then also persistent ignorance. Whenever we just think, well, they're saved, but we know they're not. And we just convince ourselves that they are so that we don't have to say anything to them. But whenever we neglect sharing Jesus, and you can share Jesus, I'm not just talking about evangelism. You share Jesus through prayer, uh, praying with people, through kindness, witnessing, giving. But whenever we neglect evangelism, which is what God has called us to do, we neglect what God wants us to do and we disobey. 
God says that you are my ambassador. You're a postal worker for Jesus. And you're taking the uh, salvation invitation to everyone around you. And the Great Commission says, go, baptize, and teach. It does not say, come, set, and eat. But what do we do more often? I'm just as guilty. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, but if nobody hears about it, how can they be saved? Jesus told a parable about two sons. We'll conclude with this. In the parable, Jesus says, what do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. The tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe in him. Jesus is speaking to the religious leaders of the day. He's saying, listen, God, this is your job, but you're not doing it. But those who you view as less who've been forgiven of so much, they're doing it. We've got to do it. We have to recognize that, sure, none of us are murderers. I hope not. I, I don't know what your past is like, but if you're in Jesus, all of that is new. Everything you've ever done has been forgiven. Let's accept God's grace and go to work for him. At the beginning... I said that the destiny of a Christian is to uh, receive persecution. But that's only the tip of the iceberg. You see, you think about an iceberg, you only see a portion of it. The majority of the iceberg is at the bottom, underneath the water. And that majority of the iceberg is the rest of our destiny. That majority of the iceberg is what happens whenever we leave this earth. Sure, we're destined for persecution on this earth. But we're destined for eternal glory with God. On the next. Jesus did not leave us as orphans. He sent his Holy Spirit to live in us and to move us beyond persecution towards eternity. Jesus' words spoken to the apostles echo through time. He says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. See, beyond this life, we're heading towards eternity. And oh, what a day that will be. You will trod on the streets of gold. You will take your house, your mansion, just over the hilltop. Before that day gets here, you're going to have to walk through the swamps of this world. You're going to have to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But what you endure on this earth is nothing compared to what awaits you in eternity. So dare to share the gospel. Delight in the light of the truth and please God and receive your eternal inheritance. If you would, please stand as we sing the song of invitation, Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus.